just played in Memphis and it was like going to the Holy Land. You walk into the Blues Museum and you go, God, this is really a small place. You spend 15 or 20 minutes in it and all of a sudden it just hits you. A handful of people changed everything. Growing up in Texas, like, I started my first working band. I was 12 years old, and there were no rock and roll bands. It was 1956. We'd watched Ricky Nelson and the Ozzy and Harriet show play at dances. They would come in with James Burden and play three songs at the high school hop or something. We went, hey, well, we can do that, because I ran into a kid in the seventh grade who'd been taking drum lessons since he was five found another kid and we put a band together, sent out letters to everybody and said, we've got a rock and roll band and you can hire it. And I had the band booked for a whole school year at 125 bucks a night. I was 12 years old. And it was all fraternities and they never asked how old we were. And we started playing blues. When I was 14 years old, I backed up Jimmy Reed in Texas. Played all through high school and then I went to the University of Wisconsin for college. I got there, it was 1961, they didn't have any rock and roll bands in, in Wisconsin, you know, so I had the first rock and roll band on the campus. Boz Gags was in that band. Boz was in the high school band too, so these were really good musicians. The blues, it's the foundation for everything. Where I grew up in Texas, if you didn't play blues, you didn't work. Everybody played blues. Jimmy Reed tunes were number one on the white kids' top 40 radio. Bo Diddley, Muddy Waters, you know, Little Walter, we knew about all that stuff. I went to Europe to do a semester, and it was the first time since I was 12 years old I didn't have a performing band, I wasn't working. When I was in college, I was taking creative writing and comparative literature, and I thought I was gonna be a writer. I thought I was gonna be a journalist and a writer, and probably a teacher. And I spent like six months in Copenhagen in 1963, and I came back, and they'd just done a write-up about Paul and Time Magazine, and I just, I just went, I could do this, I could do this. So I, I came to Chicago, I met Barry Goldberg, we put a band together, and uh, we started playing. The next thing you know, Barry had written some songs and he had a, a manager who was a hustler and they got a record out on Epic or something and we were in New York doing a hullabaloo show with the Supremes and the Four Top, you know, just like that. There was this whole scene going on. So I saw the whole New York scene we had this blues band, and we were really a, a no kidding Chicago blues band that worked in bars. The nightclub business in Chicago is basically a mafia police operation where the police shake you down for money and the mafia shakes you down for money. I couldn't wait to get out of there, but the time spent there, I probably heard Muddy Waters play a hundred times. <laughs> Times played with Howlin' Wolf, became really good friends with Howlin' Wolf. Otis uh, Rush was like just crazy. Like every time I go to see Otis, he'd see me, 
He waved me up to the stand. I could just go over to see him play in some club, and he'd see me come in the door. He'd wave me up to the stand, take off his guitar, give me his guitar, and then go sit at the bar and drink all night. Time to leave Chicago. Everything's happening in San Francisco. You can go play at the Fillmore Auditorium and make 500 bucks a night instead of 125 bucks a week. It was like that kind of a move, and so I went to to, to San Francisco, and um, the first night I was there, man, it was a Sunday evening when I arrived. I was living in my Volkswagen van. Butterfield was playing with the Jefferson Airplane, and. Um, they had just changed lead singers, and uh, Grace Slick, it was her first night. And I immediately weaseled my way up on the stage with Butterfield and did um, Yonder's Wall and a couple other tunes, and then announced who I was and that I was bringing my band, which I didn't have, to San Francisco, got a big cheer, and you know, started, started there working in the Matrix nightclub, and then we worked our way up. Earlier singles weren't as good or as clear, or didn't grab you as much. I mean, some of them, like Living in the USA, people know those songs, you know, but they weren't anything like the, the Joker or stuff like that. People talk about me, darling. They say I'm doing you wrong. Yeah. Well, don't you worry, baby. Everything was built around harmony and choruses because I love to sing. I was the band that backed up John Lee Hooker when he came to San Francisco the first time, and we were friends, and I played with him a lot and, and knew him really well and recorded with him and everything. And I kind of thought I knew everything about John Lee Hooker, and I started listening to John Lee Hooker tunes, and I didn't get off of John Lee Hooker for two and a half days. And there was so much in all of his recording that hasn't even been explored. So if you're a young kid and you're really interested in blues and, and guitar music, get yourself all the John Lee Hooker records and listen to all of them and take notes. Boom, 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 boom. Gonna shoot you right down. At all your feet. Take you home with me. Would you in my house? Boom, 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 boom. I just played in Memphis and it was like going to the Holy Land. You walk into the Blues Museum and you go, God, this is really a small place. You spend 15 or 20 minutes in it and all of a sudden it just hits you. A handful of people changed everything. I mean, they created jazz, they created rock and roll, they created country music, they created gospel music, they, just, they created it all. Willie Dixons and Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolfs and uh, people like that. This is really classical American music. 